Hey everybody, welcome to I'm Just Not Technical. My name is Melissa Esquivel and I am the editor of the brand new ES Tech Digest. I speak internationally, I'm the head chicken charge of Sawbuck Seminars, and a Microsoft certified trainer and Excel expert. I'm so glad you're joining us today. So where are we headed? We're going to talk about why you might feel that you're just not technical. I still hear that and it still kind of breaks my heart. So we're going to talk about why you might feel that way. We're going to talk about the obstacles it's probably creating in your career and maybe how to overcome those. We're going to give you three strategies today to get past it and to kind of work with just accepting that that may be your first impression of your skills, but it doesn't have to be a lasting one. So you may have heard this term. In fact, you may have heard it at this conference. There's a great article out there about imposter syndrome uh, in Harvard Business Review, and it's called Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. Imposter syndrome is loosely defined, as it says, as doubting your abilities and feeling like a fraud. So you may be able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, but when people tell you, hey, it's so awesome that you can leap tall buildings in a single bound, you go, oh, it's nothing. And you really don't believe that it's anything special. So what I like about this article is it says, stop telling women they have imposter syndrome. Now, whether you are male or female attending this conference, this telling people they have imposter syndrome is kind of an easy way out to explaining why you have a problem. So let's look at it another way. The first thing to understand is you have probably been set up to feel this way. Now, speaking specifically around gender, if you're a woman in business, this is still a mountain we're climbing. We're getting near the top, nearer every day, but it's still a mountain we're climbing. If you are a man in the role of assistant, it's that title that people want to occasionally, not everybody, but in some companies, it's that title that people feel is um, less than. So you may have been set up to feel this way from the beginning. And there may be those in your organization who are interested in keeping you here. I'm thinking specifically about getting a seat at the technology decision-making table. Um, if we invite you, uh, then we uh, have to listen to what you have to say and we might not like it. So there may be people who are interested in keeping you here. And for many people, it may be ignorance more than malice. There is an understanding of your role, which for some people doesn't translate to this person has value to bring to the decisions that our organization makes. So I always say, don't address the individual for being ignorant, just rise to the challenge. So in thinking about the way you see yourself versus the way others see you, if you look in the mirror and you see a kitten, <laughs> um, but in fact you are a lion, um, you may not act like a lion because you see yourself as a kitten. On the other hand, if you look in the mirror and you really recognize all of the strengths you have, all of the personal power you have, and all of the knowledge you have to share, you're going to avail yourself of the opportunity to show it. So I would say in a lot of cases, you may be your own worst enemy because others see you as a problem solver. Think about an average day and how many problems you're asked to solve with, by the way, very little clues and very little information. And yet you somehow always solve the problem. You are seen by others as a jack of all trades. Uh, whether it's knowing how to get lunch ordered quickly or knowing how to uh, work the new expense system to get everything in there and get everybody paid on time, or whether it's Microsoft has released yet another version of Excel and you're the one who's going to know where stuff is, people see you as a jack of all trades. You can do lots of different things. 
and can leap tall buildings in a single bound. Many of you, and I wish more of you, received accolades from the people that you support going, I have no idea how you pulled that off. They truly do see you as a superhuman. And they see you as somebody who is willing to tackle things you have not tackled in the past. So this is just who you are to them. This is how they see you. But as soon as we bring up technology, I hear people say, well, you know, I'm just not technical, and so I wouldn't take that on, and I don't know how that works. And it's so interesting because I will hear this from people who I have seen do amazing things with zero background and zero information. But I say, hey, let me, for example, I'm teaching a um, certification course right now, and these are some of the most highly qualified EAs I've ever worked with who can do many amazing things, and most of them are panicked to take this exam. Even that they have a retake, they're still panicked to take the exam because, oh my gosh, it's technology. So the obstacles that this may be creating for you is you may not step up for some projects. And this, I think, is not only holding you back, but it might be holding your organization back, the fact that you don't step up for some projects. You may not offer to solve the problems that come your way because they have to do with technology. Even if you have an idea of how it might be solved, even if you have no familiarity with a particular system, you've been working with systems your entire career, and there are some things that follow from application to application. Hey, did you try pressing F1 for help? Or did you press enter instead of tab? So you may not step up because you don't know for sure because it has to do with technology and you don't get to show off your ability to be a problem solver in the world of technology. And because of all that, you don't necessarily always get invited to the table. When organizations are rolling out new productivity platforms like Microsoft 365 or Google Workspace, if you're doing a shift, um, my MO as a consultant is to always bring the highest level assistance into the room because you guys use these tools deeper and wider than anybody else does. But if people don't see you stepping up, they may not see that you will bring value to the table if you get invited. So these are obstacles that are blocking your progress in your own career. So let's talk about how we overcome it. You need to make a plan. This is not something that you just say, okay, I'll be more technical. <laughs> you have to make a plan. So first and foremost, you know, you got to know what you don't know. Uh, when you are facing something like being asked for assistance in a system that you've never worked in, you have to be honest. You know what? I'm not sure I've never worked in it, but you can ask questions. So what specifically are you having trouble with? I will get people coming to me coming to me as a technical consultant going, well, this process just isn't working. And my first thing is to ask a question. Okay, got it. What's not working? What are you doing? And what is the system doing? Now, you can ask questions like that, whether or not you've ever worked in something. They may start with, hey, do you know anything about AutoCAD? And you might say, well, I've never worked in AutoCAD, but what kind of a problem are you having? So you can step up and, and be honest about knowing what you don't know, and you can ask questions. By asking questions, you're going to learn, and you're going to be able to help them, and they're going to learn. On a larger scale, when you do have a, a new rollout or implementing a new expense reporting system or moving to a new travel reservation system, offer to be the pilot person for it. Let me pilot this software. If you're moving from, um, you know, using Excel to manage projects to working in Slack or working in uh, Teams and Planner, to offer to be the pilot person for it. Step up and you will learn. So you have to be honest about what you don't know and you have to know what you don't know. Okay. Keep a learning diary. Now, this will be new for a lot of you, but specifically keep a learning diary. And I would say 
if you can, if your challenge is really technology, make your learning diary just about technology. If you were not able to solve a problem or you were asked a question you didn't have an answer to or you heard something being discussed, write it down. Um, and then if it's really interesting to you, if your next thought was, I don't know, but I really wish I did. If you don't care so much about it, you might still write it down, but you might not star it as, hey, this is interesting to me. I have seen people in the administrative professions come out of this profession and come into system administration or being a database administrator or being uh, a BI, a business intelligence dashboard creator, uh, simply by saying, you know, I don't know this. I mean, jot it down, but boy, that sounds interesting to me. And let that interest drive you to the plan you make to learn more about a particular thing. And then schedule when you're going to learn it. Now, you can decide something's interesting and that you really wish you knew more about it, but if you don't make that a task that you need to do, you might not. So set goals for yourself and by all means celebrate reaching them. And I don't care whether celebrating means you go down to your local cafe and buy the extra special coffee that you never get, or whether it's just uh, doing what I always teach my six, uh, six-year-old granddaughter to do when you've done something amazing, stand up and go, ta-da! <laughs> because if you don't celebrate it and you don't acknowledge it, you'll lose some steam. So know what you don't know, keep a learning diary and jot down those things you don't know and star the things that really, really jazz you and then make a plan to get there. One of the best ways to fill your learning diary is to ask the question in your daily work, is there a better way? So for example, can we automate this thing we are now doing manually? Um, even in 2021, uh, I comb social media every day to see what um, you are interested in, what you and other people in your career are interested in. And I see a lot of manual process going on, a lot of things that are taking a long time because we're still doing paper or we're still taking one piece of information and putting it through, I don't know, 18 steps when it could probably go through three. So ask along the way, can we automate this? And maybe the answer is yes. And maybe you take five minutes to go out there and research, hey, people are automating um, expense reporting. I mean, I keep going back to that, but I know there are still people pushing a lot of paper to get expenses paid. So can we automate this? Is there a better way? Is there a faster way to do what we're doing? So maybe right now we have to input some data and then we have to wait to get a report back from another system. And then we have to route something that we create with that data to get an approval then we have to make sure that we see it in our email and then maybe it needs to be routed to another system. And then once we get it back that it's in the system, then we have a date when it's going to happen. Is there a faster way to do what we're doing? One of the ways to determine is there a, f a faster way to do it is to ask the question. Many of you are a member of the Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups for many admin, uh, uh, admin interest uh, discussion groups, Executive Secretary Magazine, uh, for example. So go out there and say, hey, you know, it's taken us six days to do this or six hours to do this. Who's got a faster way to do it? And you might hear some interesting solutions. Can this be easier? So maybe it's not taking so long and maybe it is automated, but maybe the system you're using is just really frustrating. Um, I have occasion to work in many online systems, uh, both in doing my work and training. And I always get a little bit wrapped around the axle when I uh, see a system and it's like, you know, this should really just be a simple press of the enter key. Why do I need to click here and click here and click here and then click this? So ask yourself, can the thing I'm doing, can this be easier? Can the screen be easier? Can this process be easier? These are all questions for you to uncover opportunities to rise to the occasion and get into the technology to see if there's a better way. And then finally, is this the best application for the job? 
And here's kind of where I want to talk about this for a minute. I see a lot of folks creating documents in PowerPoint. Now, PowerPoint has a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of cool things you can do in PowerPoint relative to graphics and laying things out. But precious little is not available in Microsoft Word. So rather than generating a PowerPoint presentation for a document that someone's simply going to read, produce a document in Word. If a presentation is going to be made, if you're going to stand up and talk about it or talk about it in an online meeting or somebody else's, that's a really good use for PowerPoint because there's a lot of tools in there that can make a presentation very interactive. So is this the best application for the job? Some folks are using Excel. I mean, trust me, me being the Excel geek, uh, my first go-to place for the solution for every problem is usually Excel, but it's not always the best application for the job. Now, I don't want you feeling bad about using these tools for the wrong job because many of us will begin our work on a project in one tool and be able to lay it out and plan it and brainstorm and sketch things out and then say, right, okay, so do I need to wrap it up in here or do I need to then move all of my great work into something else? You'll find many times that the process of moving all of your hard work into another tool really isn't all that hard. And then you're using the right tool for the job and you're also stretching a little bit because maybe that tool is not something you're used to using all the time. This is your opportunity to get better at it. If you're using um, Microsoft Word or PowerPoint to do organizational charts, if your organizational charts are really simple, that's awesome. If your organizational charts tend to be a little bit complex, maybe it's time to learn Visio. Um, and some of you just stopped dead in your tracks and said, my company won't buy anything. Um, you can take that no, or you can write up a justification for the tool that you need. That takes a bit of confidence. That takes a bit of analysis. You can describe how long it's taking to do the thing that you're doing now and how much faster it can be in another system. So is it the right application for the job? Push yourself to find the right application for the job and then challenge yourself to not have to reinvent the wheel in a new system, but move all of your hard work to something else. So here's an opportunity to really uh, dive into the technology that your organization uses, that it depends on, that it provides um, in whatever uh, context that is. When you're taking meeting minutes and you hear an acronym thrown around and you don't know what that acronym means, you may not have the, I don't know, social currency to step up in the meeting and go, hey, 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 what was that? What did that mean? But you can jot it down in the so on the side or jot it down on another piece of paper or just jot it down in the notes that you're taking and circle it or bold it if you're doing it in Word. And then go back and figure out what that was. Call somebody said, you know, hey, you know, we were talking about this and I was taking minutes and you mentioned this acronym and I didn't know what that was. What does that mean? Most people will take the few moments to tell you what it stood for, at least, if not then quote you chapter and verse on exactly what it has to do with. I'm one of those people. If you hear me say an acronym and you don't know what it means and you say, hey, Melissa, what does that mean? I'm liable to tell you more than you wanted to know, because a lot of people that are in the line of work I am, we like to feel smart, so we like to tell you. Um, if it's not an acronym, but just a term, um, what is that term they used? What does that mean? If you have the fully spelled out term, you can look that up. Or again, ask the person what that means. Now, give yourself credit for having lived through a few technology refreshes. If you have, if you hear something in one of these meetings, let's say it is about a rollout, a new technology rollout, or um, somebody's doing analysis of new systems or uh, having to meet a new um, compliance uh, set of regulations, set of compliance regulations, and now you have to make a change. And you're hearing them talk about how they're going to do that. And you're like, yeah, 
That just doesn't sound like the best way to do it. You don't have to bring it up right there, though, if you do have the social currency in that situation to do it, you can ask, so I'm just curious, why are we doing that or why are we doing it that way? Now, when you ask that question, two things happen. You're going to learn something because they're going to start explaining it. Number two, and I have seen this happen a lot because uh, sometimes I've barely had the social currency in a room to ask the question, but hey, why are we doing it that way? Just in their own discussion, they may change their mind. And if they do, based on your question, you need to pat yourself on the back for that one and then go learn about that because you just brought insight to the table that they did not have. I've often been in a situation, um, the story I always remember is uh, going into, at that time it was called Kinko's. And I believe this was in Rochester, New York, which if any of you are from uh, that area of the U.S., you know, it gets very windy in October and very cold. And the way this organ the uh, store was set up is the counter was right near the door and the door had those automatic sliding glass panels. And so the panels would slide open, the wind would rush in and all of that paper on the counter uh, I was watching the people who worked there literally rush over to lay on the paper so it didn't blow away. And my question or my thought at that point was, the people who designed this store have never done your job. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because when you're listening to people discuss how something is going to get rolled out, for example, or how something is going to get deployed, or how uh, they're going to convert data from system one to system two. And you're listening to it, and your gut tells you that you don't think that's the right way to do it. Just ask the question, why are we doing that? Because they have not done your job. They don't realize that the way they're doing it is going to cause you to have to do double work or is going to possibly result in loss of data or isn't going to be possible because there's something about the way you work and the way you know others work that's going to keep them from doing it the way they want. So when you're in the process of taking meeting minutes and you're getting to listen to all these plans, that's a time to ask some questions. If not during the meeting, later. Flag it on the side, get your own little notation of things that you want to ask and write them down because those are tremendous opportunities to get involved in the technical decision making at your organization. At the very least, learn something new. So there are a lot of resources you can avail yourself of to become more technical or to feel confident in the technical skills that you already possess books, websites, podcasts, courses, all that good stuff. I love this picture. I found this picture and I had to put it there because back in the old days, my old days, when I wanted to know something, I went to the library and I would go into the card catalog and I would look it up by topic because of course, I don't know who's writing books about this thing I don't know about. And I would go find three or four titles and I would go find them on the shelves and look through the table of contents and thumb through the index until I found one or two books that was going to answer my question. And sometimes I would do this just for the heck of it. Now, I know I'm a geek and geeks do these kinds of things, but I was driven to know the thing I didn't know, especially if I felt that not knowing it may be holding me back. So I want to take a look at some of these resources, these websites and certifications and higher education opportunities and courses that you can approach to start planning your learning strategy. Okay, so let's take a look at some books. So, of course, a little shameless self-promotion here on my behalf and behalf of some of my favorite colleagues. Um, there are some books out there that you can grab, ebooks uh, and uh, hardcover books. Uh, one of my uh, recent favorites is uh, by Rhonda Scarf, Alexis Stealing Your Job, a very provocative title, but a very good read if you want to understand the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, on your career and your future. It may seem like, well, I won't have a career or a future, but what you'll learn in Rhonda's book 
is that the more you understand on what AI really is, the more you'll understand that your role in your organization's use of systems that function on AI, that your role is very important. So dirty data, if the area of technology that is scaring you is Excel, you can grab my book, Dirty Data, Excel Techniques to Turn What You Get Into What You Need. Um, Excel seems to be one of those little tokens that you trade uh, at a table full of people who are data heads like me, where if you know your way around Excel, it's instant credibility. And really, to be fair, a lot of Excel isn't that hard, but people have made it harder by the way they set up their spreadsheets. And so Dirty Data actually addresses just that and takes some really complicated, unnecessarily complicated things and helps straighten them out. And that is a very valued skill. Dr. Monica Seely and I have uh, just released 100 Tips to Supercharge Your Productivity. And in there, we talk about everything from Outlook to OneNote to um, uh, other apps that can help you do what you do faster, better, uh, and uh, with more facility. So a book like that, it's just brief chapters. Every chapter is a different topic, and you can learn something new there around technology. Her book, Brilliant Email. If email is eating your lunch, that's an area of technology all of us can afford to get better at, learning how to write a proper email and how to buy back time and increase your productivity in the thing that you spend a lot of time on. Um, Vicki Soak 11's uh, Using Microsoft Office for Windows 100 Tips, uh, specifically 100 life-changing tips. And indeed, anyone who's ever sat through Vicki's training or read any of her material knows that that is not an oversell. Uh, Vicki uh, has written some material that is really amazing and I guarantee you will make you feel not only confident in the way you use the tools you use every day, but inspire you to start looking further. So a lot of these books ask people about their books. No doubt during this conference you've learned about some books get them, have them. Uh, you don't have to read them cover to cover in one sitting. Every day, maybe as part of your plan, you go out and read a chapter out of one of these books and say, oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. And maybe start integrating that. Uh, yes, it's going to add to your skills, but it's going to add more to your confidence and your ability to learn something you don't know. Okay, let's talk websites. Now, there's a gazillion websites out there that you can add to your go-to learning library to become more confident in your technical skills and build on them. Um, I'm probably in this one once a day, so support.microsoft.com. There's actually a tips link, and that will be in the handout, and they put out new, the stuff that's new in their software, so what's new, templates, tips for working remotely. This is right on Microsoft's site. Now, especially what's new, this one, with the advent of um, software as a service like Microsoft 365, things change all the time. And a site like this, or going to Google's site, uh, support.google.com, put in your question or your issue, and you'll most of the time find that it's already been solved. These two sites, and I would say depending on your use of the platform, um, I would bookmark them both. More and more I find myself working in both platforms, but bookmark these two sites. This is where the information will be on how to get something done in your productivity platform uh, applications. Now, this is my personal favorite on Excel, M-R-E-X-C-E-L, otherwise Mr. Excel.com. And this site has been around for, I don't know, 100 years. I'm sure Bill would not appreciate me saying that. But uh, Bill Jellin, who is uh, Mr. XL, uh, the original Mr. XL, uh, has had a site called MrXL.com since, I don't know, since I started working in this stuff. And honestly, this is 
where you're going to find the experts in Excel. Bill Jelen is the guy that Microsoft talks to when they're changing Excel. So absolutely, put this site on. You will find many answers to really geeky Excel questions right here. Now, your administrative professional sites, Office Dynamics, Joan Burge's company, if you go out to officedynamics.com, you will see courses out there that have to do with technology and have to do with using technology efficient, uh, efficiently on the job. So keep abreast of these kinds of websites. Uh, there are several administrative professional organizations that if you visit their sites regularly, you'll see some free training pop up and some opportunities for other training that may exactly meet your roadmap to becoming more technical. When you find a great site, bookmark it, share it, post about it. And this is more than just websites, guys. I'll tell you, the single best way to retain anything new that you learn about is to teach it to somebody else. Share it with somebody else. So whatever your go-to websites are, have them bookmarked and go to them. Don't wonder, don't struggle, go out to the site that you start depending on and go find out how do we do a thing. Okay, uh, publications, Executive Support Magazine, formerly Executive Secretary Magazine, always has articles in there about technology. Go to execsectech.com and that is, uh, you'll see an opportunity to sign up for our free digest. Uh, comes out every other month called ES Tech Digest and it is all about technology. What's new, what's cool, tips and tricks, books we're reading, podcasts we're listening to. Forbes Innovation is another website to go visit. So if you go to Forbes.com slash innovation, you'll see a lot of interesting articles there about technology, about big picture stuff. And it's really, really good to just have kind of a handle, not on just the technology that you use every day on your job. Look at this article, How Secures Your Software Supply Chain. This is really interesting information, and it may sound like, something you might not go pick up and read in your dentist's office, but the more you have an idea of how technology is impacting your business, the better you can do your job and the more valuable you are to your organization. So step out of just things to do with being an administrative professional and look into the industry things. My friend um, Neil Malik. Everyday Office, great podcast. Neil has great stuff out there. He is, uh, I would say Neil's a better version of me, um, but Neil and I teach on similar topics and he does podcasts out here and you can follow him on YouTube in uh, his YouTube channel, Everyday Office. And he's always got something new uh, that you can learn and new that you can apply on the job. And then Simon McCaskill, Future Work, Rest and Play. Simon is one of the best guys on Google that you will find. And his style of explaining things will really make the more uh, advanced features of Google Workspace um, accessible to you. So you'll really enjoy Simon's uh, podcast if you have just... Uh, uh, gone to work with an organization that is using Google Workspace or your organization has just transitioned to Google Workspace, absolutely subscribe to his podcast. Start listening to it. You're going to learn something amazing, I promise you. So put these things in your plan uh, to learn uh, more about technology, become confident, and then schedule your growth. So you want to start sentences with, and I mean all of these, <laughs> not just one of them. By the end of the month, I want to know how to write a VLOOKUP formula in Excel. By the end of the month, I want to know how to write formulas across uh, spreadsheets in Google Sheets. By the end of the month, I want to become really comfortable running Teams meetings. By the end of the month, I want to understand how to build additional um, resources in my Teams channel. 
and then each day. And things you can do each day are each day I will write something in my learning diary. Each day I'm going to stop for the 15 seconds it'll take to say, you yeah, have no idea what that means. Let me write it down in my learning diary to follow up on. And then each week, and maybe each week is going back to that learning diary and look at the things you starred and making a plan for how you're going to learn about them. Maybe each week means each week I'm going to go listen to a podcast. I'm going to go ahead and um, bookmark a few of them that I really like and I'm going to go listen to a podcast or I'm going to look up some uh, look up and subscribe to some YouTube channels every week. Now you do need to set aside time but we're not talking about hours and hours. We're talking about five minutes here, 15 minutes there just so you stay on track and then set a big goal. By the end of the year, I will have my MOSS certification. By the end of the year, I will uh, get a uh, administrator's uh, certification in Microsoft 365. By the end of the year, I will learn how to easily create dashboards in Power BI. Whatever it is, set a big goal. Maybe it's completing a degree. Maybe it's completing some university-level coursework, whether or not you get a degree. But schedule it and commit to it. Put things in your calendar. Find the day of the week, which is least crazy. I'm not going to tell you to find the quietest day of the week because I know you don't have one. But find the day that is the least crazy for you and do your 10-minute, 15-minute, 5-minute activities to keep on your growth scale because you don't have time not to have time. You don't want to find yourself in a year not being qualified for the job you have simply because you did not learn how to do a thing or learn more about a particular system or become uh, more uh, comfortable in SharePoint or more comfortable in Teams. You don't have time not to have time because your job is changing all the time and you need to keep up with it. So there are courses out there that are very accessible. Of course, you know, I'm going to talk about Sawbuck Seminars. You can go out to Sawbuck Seminars and hit Upcoming Webinars, and you'll see all the courses that we have coming up. These are 10 bucks a piece, guys. We usually spend about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the topic. Uh, you can attend live if you register for it. You can get a recording. You can learn more about all this at my booth. But $10, if you can afford $10 US to learn a new topic, do it. If you join Watch and Learn, you're going to have all these videos for a year, and you can always go back and pick one you haven't listened to and learn something new. Gartner Group, Tech and Service Provider Webinars. There's a bunch of things out there. And again, don't shy away from something that isn't specifically about your job. I mean, this one sounds interesting capitalize on hyper automation well what's meant by hyper automation uh top trends for product management uh tactics for tech ceos if you're supporting a tech ceo it would be interesting for you to spend the hour put this on your schedule see if you can uh, learn something that will help them or help you communicate better with them so definitely go out to that Gartner Group site. Again, all of these links will be in your handout. Um, found something really cool in Science Mag. So Science Magazine has its own technology webinars, and you're going to find some Star Trek level, Star Wars level stuff out here in Science Magazine. But the whole robot thing, if you are in manufacturing, then you know that robots are a thing. And whether they are implemented in your manu on your uh, production floor today or you're looking at it, it's coming. And the more you understand about that, the better. So here are webinars today. And maybe you're the one doing the research and saying, hey, this is really interesting to me. And bringing it up to the person you support and said, hey, you know, I really saw this and I thought it was really, really cool. And they might say, you know what, set it up purchase it or schedule it and let's do a lunch and learn on this webinar. So then you are seen as the person bringing new tech into the office just because you don't know about it 
doesn't mean you can't learn about it and doesn't mean everybody can learn about it. Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, you can find a lot of courses out there for whatever it is you want to learn about, SharePoint, OneNote, Excel, Access. You can find lots of great courses out there, you know, your Adobe, Photoshop, all those good things. So hit up Coursera and LinkedIn Learning. Please go out to Red Cape Co. If your journey is about um, Microsoft Office certification, go out there and hit Vicky's site at Red Cape Co. Um, so Vicky's uh, calendar, she's got Moss study groups. She's got presentations on Excel. Uh, she's, of course, working with Bonnie Lowe Kramen on BV Ultimate Assistant, the virtual workshop there. So go out and see what Vicky's got going on. Take the courses. Become a student again. If you're not familiar with MOOCs, MOOCs uh, MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Courses. Universities like Cambridge, like Harvard, like UCLA, like Boston University are putting their university courses, their college courses online. And some of these are um, free. Some of these have a modest charge. You don't necessarily have to be um, going for a degree to take advantage of a MOOC. But this link is in there, and this is the 50 most popular MOOCs of all time. You can find that you can nearly get an entire college education just by doing MOOC courses. So take advantage of those kinds of things. Look at certifications. So ASEA, the Advanced Certificate for the Executive Assistant, and the Foundation Certificate for the uh, Executive Assistant, which is a new certification that um, Lucy's organization is going to be offering. Uh, certified Administrative Professional by IAAP. Uh, all of these certification tracks will include something about the technology uh, foundation you're going to need to do the job because it's just part of the job. CAPTA is the specialty certificate that you add on to your CAP. Um, Neil Malik and I have uh, taught TA for the last I don't know, three or four years, and that is uh, about being able to prove that you have facility with technical applications. Um, and uh, so we teach you how to learn technology, how to analyze technology, how to decide whether this solution or that solution is better for the job you have in front of you as it pertains to the administrative professions. Um, some of you already have your MOS Associate Certification or even your MOS Expert Certification. If you're really good at the Microsoft Office stuff, if you're the go-to person in your office, then seek the MOS uh, certifications. Um, I'm teaching a MOS associate uh, course right now. If you want to know more information, hit me up. Hit up Vicki. Vicki's also a good person to talk to about it. Um, if you're already, you know, Microsoft Office certified and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, but I want to do more, Look at the Microsoft 365 technical certifications. So I'm not talking here about an Excel expert. I'm talking here about enterprise administrator, um, desktop administrator associate, security administrator associate. You might not be doing that as your job if you're in a startup or you're working for a small organization. I saw the other day someone's really being asked to be the security officer for their organization, and they are the EA. So take advantage of some of those technical certifications. It's not beyond your capabilities to learn this thing, especially if you have interest, because your passion will drive your ability to learn it. Google has its own set of career certifications. So you can go ahead and go out to uh, grow.google slash certificates. And you'll learn uh, about, let's see, IT support level, data analytics, which to me is something really, really important and something that is going to uh, encroach in the uh, EA career field to be able to analyze data, project management. So 
don't stay away from these more technical certifications because your job description doesn't have them. So many of you are being asked to be the Teams administrator in your organization, and you were given zero training for that. So go in and get some of those uh, Microsoft 365 technical certifications and really be able to support your organization there. Higher education. So I'm not one of those folks that strongly believes everybody needs a degree to do anything because I've met a lot of people who hold a lot of degrees who aren't good at their job. So it's not about how smart you are. A degree does not tell me how smart you are. What a degree can do, however, is communicate your knowledge in a more understandable way. So it's not about how smart you are. It's about how easily how smart you are can be communicated. But information changes. So here's the other side of the argument and the case for higher education. Uh, for those of you who've known me for a while, you know that I finally graduated from college in 2015. I'm a little old to have just graduated from college in 2015. And what I found was interesting is I had to retake courses that I had already taken back in the 70s um, uh, at University of Illinois. Well, because information changed. The information that we knew about biology changed. Uh, my business law classes, certainly I took business law, but the law has changed. So information changes. We can't build on something that was valid 20 years ago in a world where things are changing daily. So one of the things in going for a higher edge, going for a degree, a uh, master's if you have a bachelor's or a bachelor's if you uh, don't have uh, an undergraduate degree or uh, an additional master's or an additional bachelor's degree, you get to see what's changed. And that will give you credibility. A degree doesn't tell me that you can do a job, but it shortens the conversation. So I want to tell you a little bit about my story with higher education, and it may inspire you, uh, and I'm hoping it does. I walked off a high-tech job in 1989, and I walked out of that job into an empty job market. I didn't really think about it. I was a 20-something, uh, how did I refer to myself, a 20-something snot-nosed tech jockey. <laughs> And I jumped into an empty job market and I really needed to work because I really needed to help support my family. So I got temp work as an administrative support person. Don't laugh. All I could do was type. I mean, I had assistance. I did not know word processing. I didn't understand uh, Lotus 123 to set up uh, to set up spreadsheets. I had people that did that for me on the job that I walked away from. So while I could get some data entry jobs and some basic clerical slash secretarial temp work, I went at night and took the temp agency's courses on WordPerfect and Lotus123. While I was learning this stuff, I gained a new appreciation for the uh, career field that you all have, because I know for a fact I would fail at it if I had chosen that as my career. Um, you guys put up with an awful lot. But it gave me an appreciation for not taking for granted that my skills were going to carry me forth into the future. So I had to go learn. I had to become updated on technology that had changed since the last time I walked out of a typing course in 1977. Uh, actually, the typing course for me would have been in 1973. I graduated from high school in 1977. I started at the University of Illinois, Chicago, right after high school. And I started working full time. And so I quit to work full time in 79. I only got two years of college in and then I quit college to work full time. Well, I realized very quickly that the jobs I wanted and the life I wanted was not going to be supported by the income I could earn with the education level I then had. So I went back to school in 1981. And I stayed in school for a little bit longer, uh, trying to work full time and trying to go to school part time. And then I dropped out of school one semester from graduation and six weeks from sitting for the certified public accountancy exam. 
My father was thrilled. So at that time, I was holding a job as an EDP auditor for the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Now, I was able to do that job because precious few people had software background in the audit profession in the 80s. So I was able to get into that job. So I had a job that actually required a master's degree. I dropped out of school from getting my undergraduate degree. And uh, let's zoom forward a few years. And then I finally graduated with my degree in business administration in 2015. So you might say, well, clearly you didn't need your degree to be successful or to stay employed. Yes, but Here's what changed for me. My opportunities doubled. The second I got that undergraduate degree, offers for work doubled. People were going out on LinkedIn. They were searching for people that taught what I taught. When they didn't see a university degree, they went on to the next person. So my offers doubled. My speaking engagements doubled. My invitations to speak doubled simply because they saw a degree. Now, I did not know one more or less thing before graduation than after graduation about the field that I've been working in most of my life. But that degree shortened the conversation about whether my uh, skills could be validated. And apparently they are validated by some letters after your name. I got new projects I would never have been asked to participate in simply because of having the credential. My professional network grew and people started finding me. So what I want you to hear by my story is I wasn't not smart because I didn't have certifications and degrees and I didn't pursue this stuff, I was. And I was, the evidence of I was, is I managed to work all those years in my field without having those credentials. But having the credentials doubled my opportunities. So the opportunity for you is to pursue some of these technology areas that you're not feeling comfortable in. Get the certifications if you are uh, part, part way to your degree, finish your degree. Bring some technology courses into it because it does, this does have to do with you. The limitations placed on you by others are nothing compared to the limitations you place on yourself. Because the world doesn't see you as credible because you're lacking some credentials, that is a solvable problem. When you believe what they believe about that, then you place those limitations on yourself. Trust that in order to have the job that you have, you can leap tall buildings in a single bound and you can learn things that you don't know anything about and become an expert on it by tomorrow because you have to, because that's your job. The career field is changing. There really isn't a choice about being technical anymore. It simply is part of the career. And so don't uh, don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Embrace not knowing. I mean, <laughs> it because of what I choose to do for a living, I get to not know something every day. Every day I'm faced with something that I have no idea about that I have to learn about. So embrace the not knowing and let interest in it drive you to learn about it because your career depends on it. Charles Darwin said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one most adaptable to change. If there's any group of people that have proven that they are adaptable to change, it's you. What you need to do is trust that that applies to technology too. And you actually are kind of technical. Bottom line, I say this all the time. If everyone knew everything, none of us would probably have a job. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you feel inspired to learn more. Please join it at ES Tech in June. We look so forward to seeing you there. And don't forget to sign up for ES Tech Digest. Take care, everybody.